Welcome to another episode of the Property Management Show with your hosts, Marie Tepman and Brittany Stevens. Our guest today is not a stranger to the show because he loves to talk to Brittany and I about maintenance, data, and ghosts, as in ghost maintenance requests, if you remember that episode. It's none other than Ray Hespin from Property Mount, and he is back to talk about what the data says about customer churn in property management. As a reminder, this podcast is brought to you by Four and Half Marketing Agency. We have been helping property managers with owner marketing since 2012, from strategy all the way to implementation. Visit fourandhalf.com to learn more. That's F O U R A N D H A L F.com. And without further ado, here is part one of our interview with Ray. So, Ray, can you like, can you just say like what what is really owner churn? What does that what can that be described as when it comes down to it? So so when people think about churn, it's oftentimes a churn of your customer. Like, you know, it's kind of interesting about property management. You have lease churn, you have investor churn. And so a lot of people track this stuff, um, but there's like big questions on like what's a good number, what's not. And so if you come back to like owner churn, investor churn in the property management space, which has heavily become a lot more third party over the last uh, 10 years, 15 years, uh, it's the people that entrust you with their house, pay you fees, pay you management fees, pay pay the servicing thing. It's how, uh, how good are you at hanging on to that person with the churn being kind of the antithesis of it, which is how many of them do you lose? So if you sign up a hundred owners and a year from now, 80 of them are with you, you have 20% churn. That's kind of like a quick math on that. Yeah. What about, does that include, um, I guess the reason why they leave, could it be anything? Could it be selling? Could it be, <clears throat> Hey, maybe you fired them. You know, one of the things that's kind of interesting, and I'm just pulling up some graphics here just so I make sure I have uh, some of the stuff that I think this is going. One of the things is, is I don't know if the industry understands how big of a deal is to master that number. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things that's pretty interesting, and I've seen some people talk about this, you know, if you talk to property management companies and they sit there and say, hey, I'm going to grow 200 doors in this year. That's a big, bold, brave statement, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but your ability to hang on to your current customers has a monumental impact on how many you need to sell. Because when they say grow by 200, what they're saying is I want to grow by net 200. Mm -hmm. That means I need to sell how much and how much am I comfortable in losing? And so I think that, you know, I did some, uh, I did some interesting stats and I've done some talks on this. I think I'll go very super high level, whatever. There's a whole bunch of stuff here, but let's say it costs you $750 to gain a customer, gain an owner, like whatever. That's your uh, BDM, it's your marketing, it's everything, 750 bucks. Mm -hmm. And let's say you're making uh, 40% margin on that customer and you generate, I think like 2,200 bucks a year on that one customer in revenue. Basically the difference between a company that can hang on to that same person for five years versus three years is a decent amount of money. But if you're a 500 unit company, it's literally the difference of a million dollars in profit. Just hanging on to an owner from three years to five years. Because what happens is, right, if you think about that entire cohort you sold, the value of that portfolio cost you something to get. And chances are, if you hang on to them for five years or hang on to it three years, it doesn't matter because it costs you X amount to get that owner. Mm-hmm. And so your ability to hang on to them for a longer period of time allows you to make revenue off of that investment that you made for a longer period. And so um, I don't think that that has been a conversation topic, talking point. They just know if I lose a customer, it's bad. But I don't think people have understood or done the math on like, if I move it from this number to this number, how much more money am I going to make? How much easier or how much easier do I make our sales engine life? How much do I make our company goals easier? All those things in there. So. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting because I, I think in the property management space, there's so much focus um, on kind of like, how do I add new doors, add new doors? And I think in general, we all think as consumers, like, I mean, it's bad to lose a 
customer. So you got to do a good job keeping your customers. But um, I agree with you. It's not focused in a sense that like they're actually key metrics. Like mm. um, on the other side, which is um, acquiring new clients, people are nerding out on the stats. Like what's your conversion rate? How many leads you get per month? But right. no one's nerding out being like, what's your churn rate? What's the ratio between this kind of churn, that kind of churn? I mean- Well, um, Ray is clearly- I know Ray is very wise and spearheading this Intellect. discussion, <laughs> nerding, <laughs> nerding out on this. Stuff. Gosh, dang, I shouldn't have said anything. The <laughs> I can see that now. Well, and and so I pulled up the stats. So on the, just the calculation. So just like, and especially if people like value their business, be like, how much is my business worth? Like that. That's a one that everybody cares about. If you're somebody that has a churn rate that is indicative of a three-year average tenure of your customer versus five years, the difference for a 500-door company with some of those generic stats that I kind of put in place was the difference of your portfolio being worth $4.9 million in revenue from that portfolio versus $2.8 million. By just literally changing how long you hang on to an owner makes a monumental impact on how much revenue that uh that business will make you over the term of your span. So, so what do people do that? Like what, what's like the first thing you think people should be assessing when they're looking at churn? Like, like, is it, is there an easy way to find commonalities for like why people are leaving? Yeah, I'll tell you what, it's an interesting science. And the reason I've kind of geeked out on this so much, because believe it or not, it actually started with our own company and realizing we desperately care about that. Because at Property Meld, we, we take money to acquire a customer. And if we can hang on to a customer and deliver a lot really? of value and hang on to them to a long time, it's the same thing. And so what I realized with it, it was like property management, our customers, it was like they operate on a recurring revenue model as well, just like us. It behooves them to do that. And so, right. so we spend a lot of time sitting there going like, how do we understand why people leave? How do we sit there and make that better? What is our guiding metrics? How do we move that number from X to Y? And so a lot of those same principles have been able to be moved to the property management business, recurring revenue business to recurring revenue business. And so one of the challenging things that can be anytime somebody says like, I want to know why my owners are churning it is a combination between quantitative and qualitative data. And I will tell you, most people are probably not going to have the bandwidth to do a lot of this. So I think in this, uh, this podcast, we can shortcut some answers for some people of what they should be in and focusing on. Cool. But <clears throat> customers are not always going to tell you the real reason they're leaving. Right. Yeah. That, I mean, no that, one likes they, confrontation. Well, well they yeah. Like confrontation. Yeah. I mean, well, even when like we lose clients, it's like, oh, I, I try because that's my job, right? Like I'm client success. Like I need to figure that out. So it's like, hey, like what went wrong? Like, do we do an exit survey? Do we, you know, how do we, pull, do we give them a, a checklist to get that data from them? But it's only as good as people actually being forthcoming with the information. And like, yeah, like Marie said, it's like people don't like confrontation or they don't want to be mean, but um yes. So yeah, so how do you get that from them? So this is what I mean, quantitative and qualitative. So the qualitative and the difference between the two is quantitative is like numerical data analysis. That is crazy important. Uh, qualitative is your ability to have some of those conversations, dig in, understand what's yeah. happening. And usually it's the story of both that will match up and say right. true root problem. So when we think about a customer and, you know, an owner or an investor turning, like you said, and there's tons of science on people not wanting to have confrontation, especially in America, we are worse at it than a, than a lot of people. And I say worse at it. Let me put it this way. We are less direct than a lot of other cultures. And so especially we have to be more diligent in this process. So like you said, Brittany, if somebody sits there and says, hey, you know what? We're going a different direction, right? If you've ever heard the whole breakup thing, it's not you, it's me. It's me. Like that is such a BS right. way that yeah. anybody, no, no, no. It is something about you. Yeah. I, I'm not saying it's me, but there, like there is something. There's so, a reason. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there is a reason. So like a big thing that I, we're into a property melt is like, 
you have to dig and ask the question. And so if you've ever heard like the concept of like the five whys, like the great story of um, there's an analogy used like going to the grocery store and this lady walks into the grocery store <clears throat> and uh, hopefully I don't butcher this. The lady walks in the grocery store and somebody comes up to her and asks like, hey, what are you looking for? I'm looking for the potatoes. Like obviously somebody can just say, oh, perfect. I'm going to take you to the potatoes. <clears throat> uh, and so if the, ne the next question, like, well, why are you looking for potatoes? Well, I have some guests coming over tonight. Who's the guest coming over tonight? Well, it's my mother-in-law. Okay, why are you cooking potatoes for your mother-in-law? And well, it's because she hates rice and it's the only thing I know how to cook, right? Like, so it's not actually potatoes. It's about something they're trying to avoid. And by asking more questions, you can actually get down to the root problem of like what they really struggled with. Now, <clears throat> uh, the very, very hard thing again, like in property management is how do you do it in a way that, that you can, but it's super important that people understand and take that process incredibly seriously because it is your one lens into understanding how you can impact or change that number. And I'll tell you another thing. You will, uh, in, well, this is, I'll, I'll put it this way. I don't think you can learn it on a survey because I don't think people are going to be honest. Yeah. You have to go dig. But the way that I've always described it in our company, it's what did you do to make them stay? That was actually the thing. So <clears throat> if you people can say that they're leaving for a million reasons and you can come up with assumptions. But if you actually find a way to solve the thing that really bothered them, chances are that was actually the thing. And so use that data point to say, where do we systematically fork that we should have given this to them earlier mm -hmm. and go back? That's the, that's proof in the pudding that you truly address the problem uh, that they have. But anyways, I digress. No. And I mean, that's good. And like, that's the thing. How do you, how do you get there even so are are <clears throat> are you chasing people down are you showing up yeah, at how, did door? You guys, <clears throat> how did you guys start because right you had nothing you didn't have a system in place you just had this <clears throat> idea that hey we are curious to know why are they leaving and so how'd you get there so, so with owners specifically because I think property managers always sit there and go okay fantastic I don't have time to do that like right what can you do like on this so we actually started with that stuff from our customers like the qualitative why do you think that they left and we've done tons of studies on why owners leave so right now today in property mail which the number is growing rapidly but i think we've got 190,000 investors on our platform um so we have lots amounts of data that can actually look at and say and look at quantitatively based on owners that stay and based on owners that leave over certain periods of time what are the common themes and threads that we can see in those things that are going to ultimately give insight to our customers? But we had to start with quantitative, qualitative. Gosh, dang it, I'm going to mess everybody up. We had to start with qualitative. That's like, hey, customers, who's actually had these conversations? And what do you think is the reason? Yeah. Because that's a starting point. We've got a million data points that we can look at and say, is it the time between this and their first time they're notified about something that's happening on their property? Is it X, Y, and Z? Like right. the data has to be pointed in the direction of the qualitative. And so the thing that we spent a decent amount of time with customers and trying to understand is like getting these things when customers do do exit surveys, why do they leave? Maintenance is the biggest one. Awesome. Tell me what that means. They were yeah. unhappy with it. Perfect. Why? Um, it's too expensive that they felt like they were getting ribbed that um that they didn't feel like their renter was taken care of so that's why they left um, all these different things right kind of gave some ideas on exactly where we should go dig to ultimately get some of these answers and say is it right wrong or 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 incorrect so so we actually started with that to actually say like hey what are some of the hypotheses like and i can tell you some of the big ones does the amount of work like the amount of work done on your property make a difference. Does, uh, you know, how much communication and updates th they need? Is it speed? Is it uh, how many line items on an invoice? We looked at stupid stuff, by the way. Like we were sitting there going like how much psychology is in simple billing versus complex billing. There's a lot of different stuff there. And so that's where we took the qualitative and came back to the data and said, now let's go see if that also tells the same story. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really interesting. And so in that like data analysis, both in the qualitative and quantitative analysis, did you see any trends? Like, are there specific categories that correlate with higher churn? You know, any, like, like you said, you were looking at stupid stuff, even like does, you know, time of year even matter? Um, stuff like that. Yeah, and there's so much more to go through. There's some stuff that's inconclusive, but you're sitting there going like, uh, there's something in there. I don't know what it is. So I'll give you some of the high, high level ones that we feel very, very good about that. If you're in property management, if you focus on these things, you're going to be successful at changing your outcomes. So the first thing is measure owner churn. I think it's just a high level. Like you can't change what you don't measure and you have to measure owner churn. So within your own company, if you were to take away one thing from this like podcast or the, this talk that we're having is measure it. Most people don't know what that number is and they can't say it's not a company KPI. It needs to be one. Uh, but so there's uh, there's three that are really good that we basically did. And I'll kind of give some of the, the framework of how we basically did some of this data. So people understand that this isn't super BS. Like, like I said, we have around 190,000 owners on the platform, owner investors. Um, that's over the course of around 300,000 uh, rental units on the platform. So pretty, pretty broadly acceptable for what a lot of the industry deals with in terms of ratios. Uh, <clears throat> and so the way that we kind of looked at it was we ultimately said, we want to know the behaviors that make an owner renew after one year, how many renew after two years, how many renew after three years. And then we also want to know and separate who churns within their first year of agreement, who churns within their second year, who churns within their third year. And so once we decided that, that we needed to be able to see those owners and we could look at our data and narrow it down to be like, who do we have data in that's renewed after those periods? And who do we have data on that's churned within that period for our customers, right? Um, So we took a look at some of the, uh, we took a look at a lot of the things that people do, like the personalized touch. I think everybody says that one, right? Like, we sell this. It's this thing that goes into every sales packet of a mm-hmm. of an investor that that personal touch. But, you know, I actually wondered, you know, how much of an impact does that have? But communication was one of the things we look at. Frequency of communication, how often, um, all that sort of stuff was one. How much work that they actually got done uh, was a second one. How much work was the repairs costing? Number two. And then we also wanted to know. You know, does resident SAT play a huge impact? We know it has, plays a huge impact on lease churn, but does it have, play a large impact on owner churns? That was mm-hmm. another one that we looked at. So the thing that was super disappointing as a platform with Property Meld, uh, we boast having excellent communication. So I would love to say that communication played such a massive role in churn. So that way we could just get everybody to the website and uh, come in and check us out. But unfortunately, communication seem to be statistically insignificant, at least the volume of communication. Mm -hmm. The thing that we don't know is the context of the communication probably has to be dug in. Uh, Did somebody communicate uh, shortly or before a large charge versus, Mm -hmm. you know, not? What were the words in there? You know, and also the method method too. Yeah. The method or it's like, is it responsiveness or is it like, like for me, it's like when you talk about communication, it could be like responsiveness versus just like sending out information they don't care about, you know? Yes. How fast from I, as an owner, reach out? Do I get a response? That's a good one. Right. I'm writing that down. Uh, so so it, it wasn't it. So that, that was kind of a, an oddball for us. We're like, okay, well, it's tough to give direction to the property management industry to say, hey, focus on more communication less. I think everybody understands their customers pretty well, can probably figure out when's the right time, but it, there wasn't a volume game. Like whoever yeah. got a ton of messages did not stay longer. Yeah. Whoever got less messages did not stay longer. Like it was pretty all over. And there's probably so much automated communication that people don't care about too, right? Like, wouldn't, wouldn't you think mm-hmm. that like people, it almost like, <clears throat> almost like you're getting marketing emails, but it's really emails about your property that you just see all the time that they, they almost like email fatigue or text message fatigue, yeah. whatever. I, my, the principle that I've always stuck to, and I think it's been in our product, you give the person what they're looking for as fast and as frictionless as possible. Mm-hmm. Like as a consumer, you don't want to talk to somebody. You just want your answer. Mm -hmm. If you want a pizza, you don't love to talk to somebody to order a pizza. You just want your pizza at your door. 
if uh, if your cell phone, you want a renewal, you want a new cell phone, you don't want to go into the store to go in and look, you just want the new phone and you want it to be at your door. So how do you make that as short as possible? And so if you think about an owner and investor and a lot of the property management, you know, I'm making broad strokes. And so I'm obviously not a property manager, <clears throat> but a lot of the times what's going on with my property, what's going on with this repair. Mm -hmm. The idea is, is that somehow they want to talk to you is what they want. They don't, they want to feel good knowing that you're taking care of it and they want to know what to expect that it's going to financially impact them. And they want to know that you're doing all that you can to minimize it. That's it. You are merely a mechanism to getting that information. And so completely agree with you, Brittany, like it's people think that it's, there's something magical about a voice. It's the thing that I am firmly believing in is you just have to give them the answers they want as quickly as possible and as easily as possible. Yeah. I love uh, whatever that. form that takes. <clears throat> so it communication was, yeah. And I, <laughs> You know, I, I was on a, I was, and I tell the story a lot because uh, it's such a good one of kind of like the changing expectations. Like everybody that is in property management, at least like five years ago, probably was like phone call. We need to be able to be reached by phone. Like that's our major thing. And so then of course we put in all these phone trees so nobody can actually talk to us. But right. I asked, <laughs> I asked this, I asked this question there. I was like, Hey, you know, and, and, uh, you're never supposed to ask a question you don't know the answer to, but I did anyways. And I was like, hey, in the room, I said, this is probably really stupid. But I said, if you have a software provider and you got an issue with your software, you've got a question. How many of you call into the toll free line? And like no hands went up. I was like, how many of you use the live chat or email function for tickets? And like everybody rose their hand. And a lot of these places have the phone number. But we sit there and say, well, phones are inconvenient. Like, I don't like to be on a 10 minute conversation. I like being able to submit it on my own terms, go in. So we all feel this way, but we keep sitting there going like, hey, but that's how I want right. people to communicate with me. And I'm like, hey, we've got a misgap in here. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, so communication as a volume was not it. The other thing that we looked at, and this is something that we worked and we built our owner hub as kind of the start of um, to make for investors is like, uh, we had customers of like, they don't know how much work we do for them a lot of the times. Like, so it's invisible. In, gosh dang, it's such a good, it's a good way to put it. Invisible work. Uh, <clears throat> and so we actually looked at volume of repairs was kind of interesting, like perception of how much work you do versus mm -hmm. don't. So that one was a surprising because I expected the inverse, but we ended up discovering that it's around 15% more work being done for owners is actually a uh, higher chance of, of renewal. Mm -hmm. If you do more repairs, more maintenance for owners across every cohort, uh, more maintenance actions performed on a property was actually better. Wow. And just to get Can you look at that compared to cost too? Like if it, oh, hit my mic. Um, like, it, would would 15% repairs mean like 50% more cost to the owner or could that be smaller smaller repairs that you know don't <clears throat> eat at their bank account as much so it's such a good question so that's the thing that we kind of looked at again cuz it doesn't make any sense right if i'm losing more money to maintenance and i'm having more maintenance on my property why am i staying longer and just as a point of clarification um 15% more maintenance, not 50. We yes, don't want that yes, much. Yes. Uh, but, <laughs> but no, <clears throat> we did enough. And you know, this was a great, so again, you take people that have done some interesting things before and expanding upon it. Uh, there was a, a industry leader that I trust greatly. And we were talking about the concept. This was three years ago. And they've actually done analysis on this. And they said 12%, like once your maintenance cost against rent roll exceeds 12%, the risk of churn is exponential after that. Mm -hmm. And so we, because we've got, you know, all the repairs, all the coordination, the cost, um, we noticed something very, very similar that 12% does seem to be a magic number. And what's kind of crazy about that is these are not people who are, they're not institutional clients. These are standard people that have a gut sense of how much money they should make and 12% seems to be this magic number to where if you stay below it, the risk of retention is, or the, 
Uh, if you stay below it, the chance of retention is significantly higher. And if you go above it, the chance of risk is significantly higher than that. That's crazy. Like yeah. that's just, that's just, that's <clears throat> cool though. That's cool to know. <clears throat> yeah. And it's really it, interesting to have numbers attached to these gut feels, right? Because like you said, you can't really change or manage what you can't measure. Mm -hmm. Yes. And well, and that's what, you know, it's kind of like running blind. So back to your question or back to your comment, Brittany, like it's actually doing more maintenance at lower cost. Yeah. It's <laughs> basically the magic formula, which is super complex, but I think we've got some things that dial that in, right? Um, but that's the super peculiar thing that I kind of found interesting. I would imagine institutions, if you're a large fund and and you're having a property manager manage, you've got your FPNA uh, associate running through the calcs and the numbers and sitting there going, no, that we don't like that number. But these are standard investors, the mom and pop, the accidental landlords, you know, that are in here. And that is still a consistent theme, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So 15% <clears throat> more maintenance uh, actions. And so that includes everything from inspections and some of the other things that we do that includes everything in turns, churn, all that stuff. Uh, but costs need to be lower. Uh, renewed owners uh, tended to be around 11% in our data, where churn owners tended to be 14%, but the break points seem to be at 12. Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, now that we're kind of like in the numbers, have you seen in the data any kind of trend in terms of what is a normal amount of churn? Like every business deals with <clears throat> churn. Um, is there a number where like, most people seem to have this kind of churn. Is it different for certain types of portfolios or sizes of portfolios? Marie, this is such a great question. And I feel like an idiot that I don't have that answer for you. But <laughs> that seems like one to dig into because I think that's what's the benchmark. Mm -hmm. Like in Property Meld, we've been sitting there trying to collect the data so we can share with the industry and ultimately share with our customers, help them get better outcomes. Um, but we don't necessarily have a benchmarked uh, thing. And, you know, I think there's a few other different data points that might be necessary to do that. I don't know. But you have different strategies, right? There's <clears throat> different property management firms that are kind of like a la carte, like very mm -hmm. easy, multi-fee. We'll do X, Y, and Z. Whereas you have runs who, ones who run uh, more conventional management, annual agreements, other sort of things. And how do we start separating common management styles or customer styles with their outcomes to say, here's what it is. But I'm guessing we could probably figure that out. Yeah, that would be, be really interesting, to. right? Because <clears throat> um, it is it is an aspect of running a business that is kind of behind this curtain mm -hmm. right now because no one's really looking into it. And given that <clears throat> you're kind of one of the first people to kind of be like, hey, wait a sec, maybe you should peek mm -hmm. into it. It'd be interesting to know, like, given yeah. the amount of data you guys have, is there some kind of benchmark? Um, and does it change depending on the type of, um, I don't know, the portfolio? Is it the size mm -hmm. of the yeah. property, stuff like yeah. that? It would, it, so, well, that was a question on our marketing survey work, right, Marie? Actually, no. Foreign House Industry Survey did not ask specifically about churn. But the survey did ask about net change in units managed over time. It also gave us some other useful insights like median customer lifetime in the industry, as well as correlations between marketing channels, marketing spend, and growth. In fact, let me just do a segue right here and mention to our listeners that if you would like to hear the results of Four and Half's marketing survey, go to 2022.pmgrowsummit.com. And you can watch my talk called Ghosts of Marketing Past, Present, and Future. Okay, I think this is a good stopping point for part one of our interview with Ray Hespin. Watch out for part two, where we cover who should be accountable for tracking churn in a company and some ideas on how to prevent owner churn in the first place. As a reminder, this show is brought to you by Four and Half Marketing Agency. We have been helping property managers with owner marketing since 2012, from strategy all the way to implementation. Visit fourandhalf.com to learn more. That's F O U R A N D H A L F.com. Thank you.